the price that has been paid for Jesus' blood and suffered for my pardon, and He was raised to overthrow.
the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. For he opened the prison doors and he parted the raging sea. My God, he holds the victory. You shout amen. Come on. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout there's joy in the house of the Lord Our God is surely in this place And we won't be quiet We're gonna shout out His praise Come on, let me hear a shout out there yeah. Come on When we sing to the God who heals We sing to the God who saves we sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on that tree and he rose up from that grave. Oh my God, still rolling stones away. Redeemed by His grace Let the house of the Lord sing 
His praise. Come on, let's shout that out. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His praise.
You've called me a Come on, here we go. When I was broken, when I was broken, you were my healer. Your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future. My eyes are open. Cause when you call my name. the blood of Jesus Christ. Lift a shout to him in thanksgiving to him. We thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Woo. Praise the Lord. Are y'all glad about it? Woo. Thank you, Lord Jesus. God has called us out of that grave and he's got a great place for us to go when this is all done. Amen. We want to sing about heaven for a minute. Is that okay? How many are glad about heaven? Come on out. To that glorious day, praise God. Yes. When we meet Jesus, oh, Father, we love you. We praise you, Jesus. We honor you, Lord Jesus. We give you glory. Come on, lift your hands. Lord Jesus, seated at the right hand of the Father. We can't even barely fathom, Lord. What's in store for us, God, for eternity with you? Oh, we love you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I looked into the heavens and saw Hallelujah. multitudes surrounding the throne, bowing down in reverence and awe, yeah. singing out a glorious song. to the Lamb of God forever. We give you glory, Jesus. Glory to the name above all names. Yeah. Glory to the Lamb of God forever. Oh, we give you glory. Glory to the name Wonder and all, yes, it did. Filled with his glory and love. So let's join in with praises right now. Oh, to him alone. Offering our worship alone. Singing holy. 
declaring there is hope and there is free I speak Jesus for your name is power your name is healing your name is life break every stronghold shine through the shadows burn I just want to speak the name of Jesus over fear and all anxiety to every soul held captive by depression. Oh, I speak Jesus. in the streets Jesus in the darkness over every end yeah that's right Jesus for my family I speak the holy name Jesus whoa shout Jesus from the mountains Jesus in the streets Jesus in darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name. Jesus, your name is power. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus peace in the name of Jesus healing in the name of Jesus Salvation in the name of Jesus. Oh, receive healing in the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountain. Come on. Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the dark. It's over every enemy. Jesus for my family. Jesus for my
glory, 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 glory. Ooh, ha, 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 ha. Hey, 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 ha, 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 Glory, <laughs> glory. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, one more big shout tonight to our King, our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Yes. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Father, we just thank you right now for your son, Jesus. Jesus, we adore you. We love you because you first loved us. <laughs> And you demonstrated your love to us. Hallelujah. When you went to Calvary's cross and gave your life for a wretch, a wretch like us. Oh, God. But, Lord, you made us and you loved us. And you made us your righteousness, the righteousness of God. And we adore you tonight. And it's you that we edify. It's you that we magnify. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Ha, 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 ha. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Ha, 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 ha. Hey, 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 hey. Ha, 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 ha. Ha, 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 ha. Hallelujah. Ha, 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 ha. Ha, 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 ha. Oh, I feel a laugh in my spirit. Come on, God is laughing at the wicked. Oh, he's laughing at the devil right now. Hallelujah. Oh, the one that says we're not free. Say, I'm free. The one that says I'm not healed. I'm healed. The one that says I'm not saved. I'm saved. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hallelujah. Well, go ahead and say hello and fist bump somebody. And tell them you love them. And God bless you all. You were created with a purpose, written in the heart of God long before you were born. He is calling you to find it. You were born for such a time as this, to be a disciple, to leave this world behind and follow him. You were designed for a destiny, one that only you can fulfill. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the ends of the world. We want to help you to know God experience his unconditional love, to be equipped and empowered to become a world changer. everyone. You having fun? Man, I tell you, how many of you like, you know, it's so important to keep yourself stirred up, right? And, and keep yourself in the Lord. But how many of you, 
It just takes a day to get out of your day-to-day -day stuff while you're here. And now you're starting to be like, okay, Lord, okay, now you have all of me because my emails are done and I'm not worried about what's going on. I am here. How many of you kind of, it takes a bit of a time to, and you're starting to really get into being in the presence? Yes? Amen. Well, you know what? Good for you guys. The emails can wait. Yes? <laughs> Just kidding, Andrew, I'm on top of mine. <laughs> but you know what I mean, it takes a bit of time to sometimes unwind. So we hope you guys are being so blessed and are fully able to unwind at this conference and just receive and soak and grow and enjoy. Yes, amen. Can we just give it up for our worship team? Yes. You know what, I'm a simple guy. I like some of the worships where it's just, I exalt thee. You hear the songs, it's Jesus, Jesus. We could just say that name over and over and over again. Jesus is the name above all, all other names. For those guys who are joining us live, thank you very much for joining us. Welcome. We have a good lineup for you tonight, and it's going to be exciting. I'm, I'm excited about tonight because it's going to be good. Me too. So, yeah, we're yes. bringing it. Okay, so we, you guys, is, is this anyone's first session here tonight? Oh, there's still a couple of you. Man, welcome. This is so awesome. But you guys are able to keep joining us. Um, we have a first-time visitors table just out here. And uh, if you'd like to take a little visit, we have a gift for you. Um, promise, like I said earlier on, we were going to take your social security number, a bank account, all that. That was just a joke. Just a joke. We have gifts for you guys. So take a, check out the uh, first time visitors table. And for those guys that have missed the first couple of days of the conference, the conference is recorded. So it will be available to you guys on Friday if you want to purchase that. So please get it because it's really good to listen to this over and over again. I mean, Jim, you have an awesome message, but you speak quick. So I want to listen to you again and again and again, you know, to get it what you said. You know, I think I got the first sentence and then it's like, what, what, what was the next one? It's like, so I'm going to listen to you again, okay? The beauty of that is like you can slow it down, like I said yesterday. Because, you know, I'm not the smartest, I was going to say smartest tool in the shed. <laughs> Clearly not the smartest tool in the shed. I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a right, joke. carry on, carry on. So I'm guys, again, just the parents, please pick up your children after the session. If you need prayer or something, send somebody to go get your kids, but don't leave your kids, you know, because like I said, we will use your kids, okay? So please do that. Um, if you, yeah, that's it. So oh. we have some book signings going on tonight. Woohoo! Okay, Charlie and Jill, who are lead our worship here tonight, aren't they just fantastic? Yes. Yeah. They're going to be signing their book tonight. Uh, Billy Epperhart is signing his book tonight. Yep. How many of you don't know who Billy Epperhart is? Raise your hand. Oh, Billy, look, there's a few. There's a few. Okay, <laughs> he's our C CEO. He's close. <laughs> he's our boss. No, he's awesome. He helps run this ministry and he's just helping to take it from level to level. We're so blessed to have him. And um, he's got such a revelation on finances and um, he has what he calls the triple X factor that God downloaded to him. Excuse me one second, I need a tissue. She's leaking again. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm like twinkling on stage. <laughs> and he has a revelation that God gave him on what he calls the triple X factor. And it's where your outgoing reduces and your income increases. And as they cross and you start investing and it crosses again, he does a way better job of explaining it than I do. But the point is that you end up in a position where you are able to do anything God tells you to do because you have the resources to do it. It's what Jim Baker teaches on as yeah. well. So he's a wealth of knowledge. He'll be signing his book tonight as well. Yeah, and Billy is also the director of the business school, the third year business school. So guys, you definitely need to check that out because it's really awesome. Okay. Yes. And Mr. E.W. Jackson is signing his book tonight. So how many of you have never heard him either? Oh, oh man, come there's on. There's so much you guys fresh are in blood in this place, sir. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> uh, is this a free gift? I don't know. Is this a Charlie free gift? and Jill, are they here? Well, guys, we can't. Who wants a free gift? It's like, I might get into trouble for this. Matt, this is like a whole bunch of, the, of Charlie and Jill's CDs. If you guys want to get it. 
He'll talk about it? Okay, so okay. I won't give this away because I might have to end up paying for that. <laughs> so I won't give that away. We'll give away the things we can. Okay, you give away that. Give away that? Yes. So guys, how, you guys, how many of you guys, whenever you feel attacked by the enemy or that, you don't feel like going to God? You don't feel like reading your Bible and you don't feel like praising God? Because that's the enemy's scheme. The enemy is trying to keep you away from praising God because he knows and praising God is where the freedom is. That's where the release is. That's where God has got everything for you. Praise is so awesome and so powerful. And this book actually talks about what the effects of praise is and how important praise is in your life. We cannot serve a God. We can't read our Bible without praise. You have to be in a thanksgiving attitude all the time. I love worship. It's like, man, I can, yeah, we can sit and talk about this all day long. Who wants this? Who needs to know more about praise? Thank you, Matt. Okay, here we have, it's a six CD series called Lessons from Elijah. Did you guys notice the sign on the way up into the um, school that says your place called there? You saw that? So Andrew covers your place called there in this CD series as well. And what's kind of cool, like me personally, the only place I have a CD player is in my car. So that's, but that's my me time too. So this is a great CD set. Matt, thank you. So you heard earlier today that, or over the, con over the few day, uh, last few days, you heard Andrew talk about how we are stewards of God's money. It's not our money. God is the source to all things and that we're just stewarding that and then we actually, as we get the money to us, we can get it through us and God will do that. This book actually helps you on how to be that steward and how to be financially prosper prosperous. So guys, this is a really good book and if you don't get this fr the free one, go buy one. Thank you. <laughs> all right, I'm going to just, I'm actually gonna jump ahead. I wanna say one of our closing announcements just in case last no tonight happens like last night did and we just have amazing stuff going on here. Uh, tomorrow, don't take it away, I need it. Tomorrow morning, you guys need to come back because we have, e I have to remember, no. Barry Bennett's here tomorrow. E.W. Yes. Jackson. E.W. Jackson is speaking again tomorrow. And Mr. Jim Baker. So tomorrow is gonna be a power packed morning in case we don't get to say that later on tonight. So uh, yeah, it's we're in for good. a good ride. Okay, where's our beautiful Julianne? This is Julianne Harris and she's over, yes, to get, she works so hard. She's over a lot of the recruiting side for Karis, but I tell you, do you guys recognize her from the live Bible studies? Anyone watch her? Yes. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> so we're gonna hand it over to you. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. So praise God, you guys, my name is Julianne Harris, like they said, and I am uh, the Karis Recruiting Manager for students for Karis Bible College. And you know, you may think, what an amazing job. And it is. Did you know we're ushering in the third great awakening? Every single day at this school. And it's supernatural to hear the stories of people, like we have people calling in and they're like, yeah, I've never heard of Karis Bible College. Have you heard of Andrew Womack? Uh, no, but I just happened to find it online. Well, perfect, because God's calling you here. So um, I just want to start off with a testimony because, you know, the reason I, I'm realizing why I'm in the position I'm in is because my life was radically forever transformed through the word of God, but it was the word of God that I got while I was at Karis Bible College. How many of you all are enjoying the atmosphere and the facilities? Raise your hand. Hey, did you know that it probably wouldn't be here if it weren't for Karis Bible College? Isn't that cool? So I get to work with amazing people, and so I'm gonna invite up my friend, my coworker. Her name is Jill Stabenow, so come on up, Jill. And she's gonna share an amazing testimony, because listen, you guys, the Word of God is where it's at, and the Word of God is what will change your life forever. And can you get it other places? Absolutely. But it's given to you at Karis Bible College, precept upon precept. And if you allow it, if you open your heart, your life can be radically different. So, Miss Jill, tell us about Karis Bible College and your experience. Come on over. 
<laughs> I'm causing Jill to step out on I'm the ledge being today. Stretched, yeah. She's being stretched. Yeah. She's being stretched. You got it. You got it. It's good. This is a place to grow, right? Amen. So. Amen. So tell us your story. Yes. Yeah, so uh, a short version of our story. In 2009, uh, I prayed a prayer on my porch with my friend, Michelle. Raise your hand, Michelle. There she is. Uh, who just moved here last week to come to Karis Bible College, by the way. Amen. From Wisconsin. Yay. So we're from Wisconsin, and uh, 2009, we prayed a prayer on my porch. We said, Lord, we read about more in your word, but we don't see it. Show us the more. And you guys know the story. A couple days later, she was on her treadmill, and she saw a man just sitting there speaking the word. He wasn't jumping all over, but he was speaking truth. And she said, hey, you got to check this guy out. And so, you know what, since 2009, I found Andrew, his teachings, and I've never looked back. You know? Uh, I was like a dry sponge. I was just soaking it up. So um, I started as a distance education student. I was a nurse. I was a nurse for 23 years. In fact, I just left nursing just this last October amazing. Uh, to work here. And uh, I'm so thankful for that, but uh, became a distance education student. That's the season we were in. Distance Ed is a great, great start. You can do your whole first year online. We had two little kids. I was a nurse, uh, again, from Wisconsin. As the years went on, uh, a, a location opened two hours from us in Minneapolis. So we have extension schools. And uh, I had just received a healing. And uh, my husband looked at me, they had just, Andrew had just announced, we have a Saturday program, which opened it up for me. And my husband looked at me and he said, you're going. And I said, I'm going. I didn't care if it was four hours, I was going. I wanted to be around people. I wanted to be under the word. Amen. And Karis is the full gospel. They teach the full gospel. Amen. Um, I want everything that's at the feast table that Jesus provided. And it's going to take me a lifetime, but I'm going to keep going. Like Andrew says, you know, I haven't arrived, but we've left. Amen. Um, and so I drove two hours, uh, one way into Minneapolis and uh, for two years. And that was every other Saturday during school. And I got so much out of it. Went to Dominican Republic on our missions trip. It was awesome. Uh, I graduated in 2019. And uh, then in 2020, the Lord said... Now's the time to move to Woodland Park. And so here we are. We came uh, last February of 2021. And again, I was a nurse. I was thinking, how am I going to leave my, my career? I wanted to leave, but I was scared to leave. Um, and so um, I knew my heart's desire was to be here, to work here, um, to give my full self to this mission. I mean, what, is, what happens here? Man. <laughs> This is worth, I told my husband just the other day, this is worth our life. What happens here? Amen. Um, I don't know anywhere else. I'm sure God has his people all over, but I'm telling you, there's something special here. And you guys, I want you to know, like, we were the people who came to Summer Family Bible Conference for years. We came when the barn was being built. Um, we came and uh, we didn't know how it was all going to work out. Uh, so we got the word in August to move um, my husband was out here December 24th. We had all kinds of thoughts, you know, about it, um, how it would all work out. You know, it's expensive and all these things. But, you know, we really just trusted in the Lord. This was, it was so much bigger than us Amen. that it was all him or it wasn't going to work. And so my husband came out here December 24th. December 25th, everything was closed because of Christmas. And we had a house December 26th. Praise God. Praise God. We had a house. And I'll tell you, uh, we house now six Karis students <laughs> at our house. <laughs> and we are full. So Amen. <laughs> Amen. if you need housing, we will help you, <laughs> but not at my house. So, <laughs> so yeah. what would you, did you have more? I was just going to Well, ask I just you wanted question. to say. Oh yeah. Tell them about so that. I was kind of nervous about speaking and I was asking Julianne if I could type out notes and she. I said no. She said no. So um, anyways, I was uh, noticing during worship, uh, some of you know this, uh, Barry, I know, I think we've talked about this, but um, you guys, in the waiting, it, it was a 12-year journey. 
of being faithful, doing just and said, going to stateside before we came here. And so I've learned to wait. I have learned how, you know, God is the same. He's the same in Wisconsin as he is here. And so it's just an assignment. It's just a location, right? So we came out here before we moved um, six years ago. And I took this picture. Isn't it interesting that this is the picture the Lord has behind me right now? And so I took this picture from the deck out there and I blew that picture up. And any of you that work here, you stop by my office and you can see it because I have it in there. Um, I blew it up as big as I could and I said, Lord, you promised since 2009 that we were coming. I don't know how it's all gonna work out. I don't have all the details, but I trust you. Amen. I wanted more. That's what I had asked him, show me the more. But you have to be willing to walk into it. We're doing more, I mean, telling you, we're just simple people from Wisconsin. And yet here we are in Woodland Park, Colorado. So again, this sat above my couch for six years and we just kept that promise before us. Uh, When the word came, our son was a senior in high school and our daughter was a sophomore in high school. We were not planning to move in that, you know, moment. But again, when we heard the word of God, You don't delay. You go where the assignment is and you do it in his timing and you trust him for the provision. I I, I mean, we're living a life that we hear about from these folks here. And it's like, oh, that's for them. But it's for all of us. He's just that good. So I just want to share with you guys, you know, that I was you, someone who came to Summer Family, someone who came here and, and saw these people who've run before us. They're further on the race than us, but he's just as good to me as he is to them as he is to you guys. Amen. Right? Powerful. So. That's awesome. Can we give Jill a hand? Way to go, sweetie. Go. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're good. Amen. Yeah, amen. amen. Thank you. Thank you, That's Andrew awesome. and Jamie. So just we just to... wanted to plant the seed of Karis. How many of you guys here have thought of Karis? Oh, look at all those hands. Praise God. And we know from uh, what Andrew always says, right? Like we know it's not the devil placing that desire desire in your heart. So I just want, I'm going to go through some real practical uh, top level information about Karis Bible College so that you know a little bit more about it. Okay. So first of all, we, our tagline here, I wouldn't call it a tagline that cheapens it, but it's how to find, follow, and fulfill the destiny that God has called you to. Did you know that God has called you to a supernatural, over-the-top destiny and purpose and plan? And we're here through the word of God, through relationship with God, we're here to help you find that purpose, plan, and destiny. Uh, Andrew found the Bible school, founded the Bible school on the scripture of 2 Timothy 2, verse 2. And that says, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Are you able to teach others also? Just a rhetorical question. (laughs) I don't want you to be like, no, I can't. Listen, I couldn't. So how do we determine how we um, teach truth? Where's the truth? The only truth is the word of God, right? And so our curriculum is the word of God. Now, if you spend time in the word of God, which I know you guys do, but if you spend unrelenting moments, uh, time, like maybe like five days a week, four hours a day, every morning in the word of God, your philosophy of life starts to change. And that's what it comes down to. What kind of philosophy do you have? Does your philosophy of life, does your truth change because the culture changes or because everybody seems to be uh, teaching and believing lies. Does that change your truth? No, it's the word of God. And so we want to be able to help teach others also. So we have uh, year one, year two, and year three. Okay. Year one is basically laying the foundation. It's finding God's will. All right. Um, we hear, we hear much teaching about spirit, soul, and body into a whole nother level. And this is what I was telling somebody today. It's like, I have a lot of people and this, I was over uh, in another department at one time and people would be like, yeah, but I've listened to Andrew like for 20 years. Do I need Karis Bible College? Here's the deal. 
is that you hear the same truths coming at you about 25 different ways through about 25 different people with their experiencing and with their experiences and pretty soon it just goes click. That was my testimony. It, it, I didn't realize how much I didn't believe until I believed it. And then I was like, oh, that's what this is supposed to be like. Hallelujah. Spirit, soul, and body, true nature of God, love of God, the Holy Spirit, healing. I'm looking at some of the amazing instructors right down here. And it just, uh, the balance of grace and faith, you guys, this is the biblical view of this world that we have to walk in. And that's another thing that we hear at these conferences is everybody's like, it's amazing. I was talking to somebody today. I don't, I can't see her. Anyway, ah, there you are. So uh, she was saying how she had went to the cafe and she went to purchase something and it was $3. And she had just run out of cash. She only had $2, right? And she's like, the clerk behind, she's telling me, the clerk behind the counter said, oh, just hold on one minute. She went to her own purse, grabbed out that dollar. That's not, that's unheard of, but that's kingdom culture. That's biblical truth. You give. And that's what it's like around here all the time. Like you've entered into kingdom living around here. It's pretty awesome. Year two, I'm just going to try to speed up here. So I think I'm over time already. Year two, uh, we learn about growing in, in the gifts, uh, flowing in the gifts, um, operating in the gifts of the spirit, um, how to study the Bible. These are just top level things, okay? How to be spirit led. Do we know how to be spirit led? Do we know how to hear God's voice? Year two, we kind of get out of you what was poured into you in year one. Now year three is those mountains of influence. That's where you pick your mountain and you go for the mountain. And so we have uh, seven third year, year three schools. And that would be business. We have film and production that has different tracks in that. We have worship, we have ministry, we have practical government. You guys, we got every mountain covered. We got global training, which is missions. And if you wanna become a Karis Bible College director. So moving on ways to attend, you can attend here on campus. Uh, either full-time day, so that would be Monday through Friday, from 8 till noon every single day of the week. That would be full-time here on campus. We also have hybrid nights and hybrid Saturdays. So that's a mixture of watching your classes at home, taking your tests at home, but then you come together and fellowship together, either at nighttime during the week or on Saturdays. We also have extension campuses all over the U.S. as well as all over the world. And we have online to where you can actually take Cares Bible College from home. So I'm, I know I'm speeding through this and you're like, whoa, that's so much. I want to know more. Well, I'm glad because we have a booth out on the concourse. And I want to tell you, you're going to see a lot of people around here. Either they're working with conferences or they'll have these black lanyards on. The majority of all the employees that work here, their lives were transformed through the word of God. And we don't, we just want to sew back into what was sewn into us. It's the power of the word of God, but it's how you get it here. Okay. So I want you guys to come out and talk, see us on the concourse at the booth. I also want to mention tomorrow from 12 to 2.30, uh, you'll see a video as well announcing this, but we have a Karis Fair. So what is that? That is, most people are like, I can't move to Colorado. Are there places to live there? Yes. I can't move to Colorado, what about work? Look, there's jobs here too, it's amazing. And so what we've done is we've heard your cry and now we have invited people from, outer, from out in the community with places to live, jobs available. Uh, we also have hiring managers from within the ministry that are gonna be there. So it's tomorrow, it's up on the mezzanine. That's the highest floor here. You can get there by the stairs or elevator. And so I would encourage you, it's from noon to 2.30 tomorrow. So if you have a desire, and here's what I want to close with, is that if you apply this week, and I want to make sure this is clear, because I think it, <laughs> there were some questions. If you apply this week for Woodland Park, Colorado campus, starting this fall, 2022, then you are entered into a drawing to win half off your first year's tuition. That's pretty awesome. Thank you, Andrew and Jamie. So that's really awesome. So if you apply, and here's the deal, applying is free. The application is good for two years. And here's what we know is God 
moves us one step at a time, you guys. So if you have an inkling or a desire to get further grounded in truth to where you can teach others also, why not just take that step? That's all it takes. And then you get clarity. Then you get, you get ideas. You get doors open to you. But it's one step at a time. You don't have to figure it all out. It's just one step at a time. And I would encourage you that step should be applying for Karis Bible College. And we will do that with you at the booth. So that's all I have to share. Uh, I think it's Andrew. So I have the pleasure of introducing the president and founder of Andrew Womack Ministries and Karis Bible College, Andrew. Thank you. Love you. Love you Praise the Lord. Praise God. So we unapologetically try and coerce anybody who comes here to come to Karis Bible College because we've seen the way it changes people's lives. And I mean, we've seen people come in that didn't even want to be here. We had one guy that his mother was a partner and uh, she bribed him and says, I'll rent you a place, I'll buy you a car, I'll furnish the thing and I'll pay you to go to Karis for six months. And so he took the deal. And when he came, he says, I'm not staying. I'm here for the car. And he told everybody, he was a nice guy, but he says, I don't want to be here. You won't see me after the Christmas break. But did you know sitting under the word four hours a day, five days a week for six months, he went back home and he had had two of his friends in the inner city of Chicago murdered while he was here. And he went back and tried to blend in and he found out that he had been changed. He was different. And uh, so he came back, finished all two years and now pastors a church. <laughs> and so even if you don't want to come, we try and get you here because it'll change you. And if you'd have the right attitude, it'll work even better. <laughs> but man, we just want you to come. You know, I know we've gone a little bit long, but I want to take a few minutes. I just really felt impressed to do this, that we've got two ladies here that I consider to be trophies of God's grace that have touched my life and inspired me. We've got a video about them, but I'm not going to play the video just for time's sake. We were going to introduce them, but if I could have Caroline Yeager and Virginia Croy, are y'all here someplace? Here they are. Come up here. I want to just introduce you to these two ladies. Yeah, we need a mic. And I wish we had time. You can go to our website and each one of them have what we call a grace encounter. And they each have about a, what, a 10, 12, 15 minute uh, grace encounter. But uh, it's miraculous. It is. And I meant them when they came to Charlotte. North Carolina. And I tell you, I just love these ladies. They are a miracle. I wished you had time to hear everything, but give them the quick two minute version of what happened to you, Virginia. Well, two minutes. Can you do that? I can talk real fast. I don't All think right. I can talk as fast as Jim Baker. Yeah. I'll try. Um, I was very sick and um, I wanted healed. I was bent over, I couldn't walk, someone had to leave me. And uh, one day I got a, well, we weren't allowed to have TV. Well, I grew up without that. And, um, but one day I was out at a yard sale and they had a TV on sitting there for uh, free. And they said, I asked them if it worked to show videos and they, the, the guy said, take it home and try it. If it doesn't, you can just throw it away. Well, it did work for, t uh, for the videos, but it never uh, worked for anything else. I always put the video in first and then turned the TV on because I didn't like the white noise. Well, one day, don't know why, I turned the TV on. No picture, but a man's voice coming over perfectly clear. It was Andrew. I didn't know it. <laughs> and he's talking about Jesus. A Jesus I didn't know because I grew up hearing a religious Jesus and he's talking about this Jesus who wanted me healed, who would, who loved me unconditionally. I grew up believing God was going to put a sickness on me and beat me up if I didn't do everything right. And um, I, I just was 
uh, shocked. I, I quick ran and got tape and put it over the holes of my son's movie, stuck it in there and started recording so that I could listen later. And uh, God brought healing to my life. He just radically changed me and brought me out of the cult. He saved me and... Yes, yeah, so thank you, Andrew. And, and then because of him, um, he gave tapes away free. I wasn't allowed to get them. My husband threatened me. And uh, he told me he would kill me if I kept speaking the name of Jesus. But uh, he threatened me I couldn't have any religious tapes or pamphlets come in. I, I wasn't allowed to buy them. So I called my sister, told her. So she bought them for me. I didn't buy them. And I'd hide them under my mattress and listen to him when he wasn't around. And um, God radically changed my life. So thank you, Andrew. And thank you, everyone who has given so that I could get those free tapes and come to know Jesus Christ. Thank you. And there is a lot more to that story. It was a major cult. Women were not counted for anything. They couldn't read the Bible. She nearly died from a ruptured appendix and they wouldn't let anybody go to the doctor and it's a miracle. And they went to the same church and Virginia got hold of this before Caroline did. And when she got kicked out of the church, had to leave, Caroline couldn't talk to her because she was a heretic. And anyway, I, I, we could give a big testimony. What happened to you? <laughs> well, uh, and her <laughs> husband was the pastor's son. Well, so is. they it still is, yes. but uh, they were really plugged in. And so for her to start flirting with something outside of the church could have meant your marriage. Everything. Yes, she yes. could have lost everything. Well, um, I always, well, I always wanted to serve God. I, I love Jesus and um, I would cry out to him all the time, but I was very lonely when I was young and you didn't have very many people to get married to. It was, you had to marry within the church. And I didn't like Craig. <laughs> we were 12 years with him, but I didn't. 12 years of school with him, and uh, we were just two different people, and I didn't care for him. And, but he asked me out, so I wanted to have children, and I married him. And it was very, very horrible. I mean, he was just taught that we were nothing, and uh, very, very angry all the time. But um, I kept crying out to God because I thought if I got angry at him, I would lose my life, or one of my children would. And uh, we did have, we waited four years to have children. I think I was so afraid I couldn't get pregnant. But I did have, uh, first babies were twins, twin identical boys. And because we could not go to the hospital, they were born three months too early. But I know where they are in heaven. They're running around. But uh, God blessed me with seven more. And uh, they're beautiful, they're healthy, they're strong. And, but through those years, I went into such deep depression. I would go in for weeks and I could not get out. And um, I had anxiety, I didn't know what it was called because I couldn't breathe. And, but I always would, whenever my husband would do something, I would run to that laundry room and I would cry and cry and say, God, just take this out because I don't want to die. I don't want my kids to die. I don't want them to be sick. And uh, I had this little post-it in the Bible and I said, God, the very, it was the scripture where God would give you the very desires of your heart. And I said, God, I want my husband to love you and then love me and the children. And 17 years, I prayed that every morning, every night. And I got angry and I said, God, why? After 17 years, you haven't changed my husband. And he said, stop praying for him. He said, start loving him the way I love you to the day he dies. If you never changes, just love him. And I was like, God, I can't do that with myself. But with you, I can do all things. And uh, I just surrendered him back to God. It took years for me to get, break down those barriers of I didn't get bitter, but I was so highly disappointed because I married a, a pastor's son and he wasn't godly. And, but my brother saw our struggles and uh, he slipped me Andrew's tapes. We, were, we weren't supposed to visit him because he had already left the church, but we went up for, he was giving us bunk beds and he slipped me these tapes and he said, uh, I think Craig would like this because he's very calm and he's, because Craig couldn't take you know, the bouncing and the screaming and whatever, you know, the loud pastors, because we were very, very mild. And, but when I got a hold of him, it was all those truths that were so twisted and so wrong. And Andrew just flipped them over because he studied the word and he, 
He gave me truth. I would sit from, from time Craig worked for work to one o'clock in the afternoon and I wouldn't let anybody bother me. I would just soak and soak and soak. So really for two years, I neglected my family because I, I just had to, had to get Jesus in me. And, uh, but my husband came away with me. We left the church in 07. He was kicked out of the church. He was fired. My kids were kicked out of school but it was the best thing that ever happened to our life. Best thing, and thank God, you know. But Andrew has been, I, even my daughter, she was having struggles the other year, and, and I said to her, she was cleaning for someone, I said, Joanne, I said, just take Andrew's tapes, or you have it on your phone. I said, and just listen to it while you clean. And she, her life was transformed. And every one of my children, I would just give everything I learned, I would give to them. And Amen. guess what Andrew taught me today? Guess what the Bible says about this? And this is truth. And uh, so yes, I, I could smile. Ever since I was saved and transformed, I wake up with a smile on my face because I don't go back into that black hole. And uh, thank God for that, you know. And without medication, without anything, God has healed me, gave me a new heart, and new mind. But I thank you, Andrew. So this church was really a cult and they wouldn't allow women to do anything. Their kids, if the other kids in the neighborhood came out, they had to come inside because you could not talk to anybody outside of the church. Uh, they wouldn't allow you to go to the doctor. And so Caroline lost two children and many people yes. in the church. Uh, yes. Women died or their children died. And uh, Virginia had a ruptured appendix and they wouldn't let her go to the doctor. And she nearly died. And she was in that state for a long time. So anyway, Virginia came out first and uh, they couldn't talk to each other because she was a heretic now. And Virginia had already started getting free. So she came to my meetings and the week before she came, Caroline finally worked up the courage to call this heretic <laughs> and found out that Virginia was coming to my meeting and Caroline had, she didn't know that Caroline had heard me. So Caroline said, can I come? And I think Virginia paid for her to come. Yeah, she did. The husband could have divorced her because she was coming. And I remember when Caroline came, she, they had never worn pants. They always had to wear a dress. They couldn't wear any makeup, couldn't wear any jewelry. And Virginia had already, and what? I said you couldn't cut your hair. Couldn't cut her hair. And uh, Caroline had already started getting free in these areas, but I mean, Virginia, but Caroline, this was all new. And when she came, she started getting free and bought some earrings <laughs> and bought a pair of pants and came and just was praying that God wouldn't strike her dead for doing it. <laughs> And just a little thing, I wanted bangs like she had, so I took her nail clippers and I did. <laughs> I did bangs before I came to his meeting. And that it day. was so funny, things that most of us don't even think anything about. It was, it was life threatening to them because they were told that if they ever violated these laws, they'd go straight to hell. And not only did God set them free, but all of their kids. I think your daughter's My coming daughter's to school now. What? All this talk, I'm stepping out. And I'm going to join too. Oh, awesome. I am. I, by God's grace, I am going to walk these halls this fall. Anyway, please go to our website and watch their video because I tell you, I love these ladies and I've seen God just transform them. They're awesome. Love y'all. Hey, God bless you. So, you know, I had some things I was going to say for the offering tonight, but we really do want to give EW more time. So I'm just going to ask the ushers to come pass out the envelopes. And again, just encourage you to be a part of what we're doing. God has expanded my vision. And you know, we've already had a groundbreaking for our student housing and the city is fighting us over some issues. So they've delayed us actually doing the construction, but we will win. And as soon as we win, we've got enough money to get started on the first student housing. It's gonna be about six and a half million dollars for the first lodge that houses 40 people. But the Lord has been speaking to me and just telling me at the rate we're doing this piecemeal, we're, we need a thousand uh, students to be housed. And at the rate we're doing it, it's gonna take forever. And the Lord told me not to limit him. And so over the last few months, we've been visiting places and I'm now gonna build a student housing. We're gonna build an athletic, center over here that is phenomenal. It's not gonna be second to any university around. It's gonna be awesome. We're building a bridge that will connect these roads with across the road over here and it'll go over the valley and we're gonna build a, 
uh, hotel and conference center thing over there. We're going to build performing art. We're going to have student housing for a thousand and it's going to be a slew of money. So, um, <laughs> unless you give $600 million, I can probably spend it. And I bet you, if you gave more than that, I could spend it too. So <laughs> instead of just giving you a lot of scriptures and encouraging you, just, I'm asking you to be a part of what we're doing because it's going to take a lot. Jesse Duplan has called me this afternoon and he just called to encourage me. And I was telling him about this and man, he was saying, that's nothing. You can do this. And I told him, I said, man, I need you to come around more often. You really encourage me. So anyway, we're going to get it done. And I would encourage you to be a part of it. If you'll do that, I guarantee you, God will bless you. And in eternity, you will, you'll have people thanking you for the way that you change their life. So Father, we just offer these offerings to you tonight as gifts and we love you. Thank you for what you've done in all of these lives, for Julianne, for all of the people that have testified about Karis Bible College, for Caroline, Virginia, and the way you've changed them and just so many other people in here. Father, we love you. Thank you for what you've done and we want the whole world to know. And so as we receive this offering, I believe that you touch people's hearts that they will give generously. And we believe that you are blessing this back unto them quickly in the name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God. You can receive the offering. So I think Charlie and Jill are going to minister to us. Are you going to talk about your uh, CDs tonight? Oh, don't worry about it. EW, we hadn't got anywhere to go. Hey man, we're going to have a good time. And I guarantee you, E.W. will take his time. So don't worry about it. <laughs> Just tell the people about how they can get your product. Well, thank you. We surely don't want to take up any more time than we need to, but uh, we do honor all the speakers and uh, we're honored to be here. We're honored to be ministering here on this platform with Andrew and Jamie. And they've been so kind to us for almost, was it 30 you can figure it out. We met you in 1980, so 42, praise God. <laughs> so God has been good. We've been uh, ministering with Andrew and Jamie all over the world, and uh, we get to come here and minister to you on this beautiful campus. And we have many music CDs out there, and I think uh, our sister prophesied. She said, Charlie and Jill are going to have a book signing tonight, she said. And actually, we don't have our book out yet, but we're about ready to. You no, it's beautiful. You were prophesying. Uh, but we will be signing our CDs tonight out by the table. So we have uh, uh, about six of them. And you want to share something? Real I quick? just want to say real briefly, <clears throat> these are all, excuse me, these are all songs of deliverance. The Bible says that he will surround us with songs of deliverance. And that's what these are. These are songs full of the word of God that will help you in your time of need. They'll keep you your focus directed on the Lord. They'll help you just keep the peace of God, the spirit of God going on in your heart all the time. So that's what all that is. And if you don't have CD player anymore, as many don't, we have all of it on USB flash drive. So all that is out there. We have two different USBs that have about 100 songs on them each. And then we've got these six pack that'll help you build up. Holy Ghost six pack, right? So, and then we do have a book coming out hopefully this fall and there's information about it on the table and you can pick up a flyer, read all about what it's, what's going on and sign up on our mailing list to find out more about when it's coming out. Hallelujah. This little song Jill wrote many years ago and it's just so precious. It just talks about the simplicity of being one with Jesus and being one with the, 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 being part of the vine. He is the vine, we are the branches. Sorry, I got all that messed up because <laughs> uh, I'm trying to rush. But uh, he is the vine, we are the branches. And the, the beautiful part of this song also just says, what can we say and what can we do in light of all the beautiful things that God has done for us? And you know, Romans 12 tells us to give our lives as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him. And I think that's the heart of this song is that we should just, out of all the things that Jesus has done for us, we should at least just offer our lives as a living sacrifice back to him. Can you say amen? He is the vine, we are the
the branches rescued from sin what were the chances he would save us and give us eternal life where would we be our lives would be wasted without his love but now we have tasted the sweetness of grace and all of his life he inside and what can we say and what can we do to show our humble gratitude may we live our lives the way he wants us to and what can we say You know, Charlie and Jill have been traveling with us for 40 years, not totally exclusively with us, but we've been ministering together. And I tell you, they're just awesome. And just like that song, it's, it's the gospel. That's not just entertaining, but man, that's what it's all about is look what God did for us. The least we can do is give back our lives to him. And that's awesome. So please check out their stuff. Well, we've got E.W. Jackson with us. How many of you have not heard E.W. Jackson? Could I see your hands? 
Wow. Man, all your statements and jokes and everything are brand new, E.W. <laughs> That's like saying sick them to a dog when a preacher has new people like this. I'm in E.W. here in 2018. Tony Perkins did a special broadcast from here for the midterm elections when Trump was in office. And uh, he brought in E.W. and he only gave people five minutes apiece. And E.W. got up and in five minutes, he was interrupted at least twice with people giving him a standing ovation, people screaming and yelling. And I don't know if they were running the aisles because I was on the front, but man, it was close. And I've ministered with E.W. since then a lot of times. And I tell you, I've grown to love E.W. This man is a blessing and I'll let him give his own testimony, but he came from extreme poverty I mean, he was headed to dead end and wound up graduating as a lawyer from Harvard, has prospered, has run for office, and now pastors a church, has an organization that is making a difference, got his own radio broadcast, and I, I've done a few things with him, and I tell you, E.W. is a force to be reckoned with. You are gonna love him. So let's stand up and welcome E.W. Jackson as he comes to minister to us. Love you, brother. Thank you so much. Amen. Well, to God be the glory for the things that he has done. Well, first of all, let me say how honored I am anytime I have an opportunity to minister with Andrew and spend time with him and Jamie. It, it is a real honor. They, they have become very special friends to me and to my wife, and we're just we're, and, and the, 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 the people who are drawn here to minister, all of you, it's just an honor to be named and numbered among you. So thank you so much. And you bless my ministry. I get people visiting pretty much just about every week or very often say, I saw you on Andrew Walmick Ministries. So, so thank you for, for your friendship and thank you for your kindness. I always have a lot of fun with um, when, when my wife and I particularly, who uh, stand up darling so everybody can see you. My wife, Theodora Jackson. She doesn't get to travel with me because we have a school, the Maximum Potential Christian Academy, and uh, she is teaching at the school and, and trying to build that school out, and she likes to stay there and work with that. Uh, so I was so glad that she could come and be with us this time so that she could spend some time with Jamie too. And, and uh, cause every time I come back, if I'm visiting here, she always, what did Jamie say? What is Jamie doing? What are they doing? So now you get to see it and, and hear it firsthand. Uh, but I also want to say this, and I think all of you know this, um, Andrew, the Lord has blessed you tremendously to assemble a really first rate team of people. And it's, it's amazing to watch Billy, your leadership, uh, Mike and Carrie and, and, and all of you, I, I can't tell you how impressed we are. And I'm blessed to be able to travel all over the country and see all kinds of ministries. Uh, I, I don't, I hear people say, you know, Andrew's ministry and others, well, I, I have to tell you, I'm still looking for the others um, that are doing what Andrew is doing. Uh, it, is a, it is a real blessing. And as I've said before, there are uh, other big ministries, obviously, that, that are making an impact but I don't know of any ministry in the country, and I've in one way or another interacted with many, many, any other ministries in the country that are proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ without apology, without compromise, and telling the truth about the issues of the day without backing down. So, the first time I came here and really began to get to know Andrew, Billy said to me, I've met them all. He said, and believe me, there's nothing like this one. And I kind of, you know, I didn't know Andrew. And I kind of said, okay, all right, well, you know, I'll just kind of take your word for it. Now that I've gotten to know them, I see exactly what you mean. Because there is a humility and a sense of giving God the glory for every wonderful thing that has happened, an unpretentiousness, a kindness, a decency that frankly, you just don't see uh, in, in, in many places. I remember going one time to a, to a, a big meeting overseas and the uh, first heard, word I heard was that one of the ministers 
uh, had his team go in and was demanding now, um, is, there, is there a lollipop on the bed? Is there, is there ice cream in the refrigerator? Is there, and had this long list of things before they would bring the person in. And we thought, wow, um, we are ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ and we owe him everything. And without him, we are nothing, but praise God, we're not without him. So we give him the glory. And so, so your support for this ministry, believe me, uh, does not go unrewarded by Almighty God because I really believe this with all my heart. God is using Andrew Walmack Ministries to awaken this nation in a way that it desperately needs. And I really believe that the awakening has already begun and this is center headquarters for that awakening. So you are part of something that God is doing in this nation. So it is an honor to be with you. Now, I'm supposed to be doing a book signing uh, that was, I think, supposed to start a little earlier than we'll obviously get started. Um, so I'll try to keep it to the three hours that Andrew gave me. Um, <laughs> And uh, I think it was Virginia and Caroline, is that with, with Virginia? And I'll try not to holler too loud because I heard you say your, your husband didn't, he likes Andrew's quiet way. I like to think I'm kind of Andrew's loud alter ego. <laughs> <laughs> praise God, praise God. I wanna call your attention to a scripture uh, in 2 Thessalonians chapter two verses nine through 12. Now I use the new King James version. It reads essentially the same as the old King James and any other version that you would be using that's valid. If you have a Bible that reads significantly different, get rid of that thing right away and get yourself a good Bible. It says, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs and lying wonders and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. And I wanna talk for a few moments tonight about something I've heard in one way or another echoed by pretty much every speaker who has gotten up here talk about the saving power of truth, the saving power of truth. One of the shortest speeches ever given in history is also one of the greatest. And it began with these words, four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether any nation, that nation or any nation so conceived shall long endure. You all know that that's the Gettysburg Address and it proposed the question 150 years ago, will this nation endure? And I wanna to suggest to you that 150 years later, we are wrestling with the same proposition. Will this nation endure? And the reason why that question is being raised is that we are in a profound spiritual battle for the heart and soul of this nation. Now, of course, this plays out in the political world and it plays out in the cultural world, plays out in the institutions of our country, but it is ultimately a spiritual battle, not a political one and not a cultural one ultimately. And by the way, for those who say, yeah, but you know, I get this criticism, but Bishop Jackson, you, you are so involved in politics and preachers ought to stay out of politics. I tell them, I, I don't think of it as politics. I think of it as prophetic ministry. I think of it as the same ministry that Moses was engaged in when God called him and anointed him and sent him down to Egypt 
to tell Pharaoh, God said, let my people go. The same ministry that Elijah was engaged in when God called him and anointed him to tell Ahab and Jezebel that they were troubling the land of Israel and that God was going to judge them for it. The same ministry that Nathan was engaged in when he confronted David over his lies and, and murder and told the story about the, the little ewe lamb that the poor man had, that the rich man took away. And when David heard this story, it touched his heart so much, he said, where is that man? That man should die. And Nathan pointed at him and said, you are the man. That wasn't politics. It was prophetic ministry. And it's the same thing that John the Baptist was engaged in when he told Herod, you are sinning against God because you have unlawfully taken your brother's wife. And many people said, John the Baptist, preach the gospel, stay out of politics, would you? But he said, God has called me to bring light to every situation. And it's about time the church realized that you can't hide light behind a, a, a wall or hide it under a basket. You've got to take it into every endeavor in life and you can call it what you will, but the church must speak the truth to these political leaders around this country because if we don't tell them, who's going to? And Andrew confronted this because we know Andrew is a, is a preacher of the word of God that preaches the truth of the gospel. He's not a politician, but politics encroached upon him when the city fathers here told him, you will shut this ministry down and you will not allow people to gather together in here. And Andrew finally told him and said, look, you don't control the gospel of Jesus Christ and you don't control Karis ministry and I'm gonna stand up against you. That's not politics, that's ministry. And the people who excuse themselves by calling it politics are cowards who don't want to confront the fact that they have a responsibility to stand up for the Word of God. So it's a spiritual battle. And it really is a spiritual battle over truth which really speaks to the very nature of life and reality. This was writ large for us when the most recent Supreme Court Justice appointee was asked the question, what is a woman? Can you define what a woman is? And she declined, said, no, I can't. I'm not a biologist. I didn't know you needed to be a biologist to figure out and define what a woman is. And this is somebody who's supposed to be highly educated, but, but was not willing to acknowledge the truth. And frankly, there was something even worse that most people didn't pay much attention to, but they also asked her during her confirmation hearing, what is your opinion about natural law? And she said, I don't have an opinion about natural law. And I thought that's even worse because my brothers and sisters, natural law is the basis of the foundation of this nation. Our founding fathers broke free from Great Britain on the basis of the laws of nature and of nature's God that they said gave them the right to do so. That our rights and our liberties, our freedom does not come from government. It does not come from human hands. And it certainly didn't come from the King of England. It comes from almighty God. And therefore we are inherently free and we have rights that are inherent in who we are as human beings. So when a Supreme Court justice refuses to acknowledge natural law, that tells you what a battle we are in over the very nature of truth. But it's a spiritual battle. It's not ultimately a political battle. And that spiritual battle is the same one that Jesus dealt with. Because remember when, when, when Pilate confronted him and said, well, are you a king? And Jesus said, for this cause I've come into the world that I might bear witness to the truth. All who are of the truth, hear my voice. And Pilate was evidently a liberal because you remember his answer, what is truth? He, he didn't realize truth was standing right in front of him and he couldn't see it. 
but we're inundated and overrun and beset by lies on all sides, trying to destabilize, to delegitimize, to frankly demoralize the church and the nation itself. And, and you know, we Christians get caught up in doing good things and we should be. You know, we wanna bless, we wanna build, we wanna edify, but we forget that there's another side to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's the side announced in 1 John 3, 8, which says, for this cause, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Amen. We've got some building to do, yes. And Andrew, the Lord spoke to me as you were ministering and told me all that you have in your heart is gonna to come to pass even faster than you imagine it will. God is going to bless this ministry in ways that we can't even begin to fathom. The exceedingly abundant above all that we ask or think. But my brothers and sisters, we have a, we have a tearing down side too. God told Jeremiah, I called you to build up and to tear down, to build and to destroy. And we've got a job to destroy the works of the devil. And we know what the chief work of the devil is, lies. Jesus said he is a liar and the father of lies. And he does not know the truth. The truth is not in him. And we, the church, have got to stand up for the truth no matter what it takes. Because my brothers and sisters, the truth can never be defeated. The truth can never be overcome. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not made anything that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in darkness, and the darkness does not overcome it. So we've got to destroy three kinds of lies I want to briefly share with you. Number one, moral lies. Moral lies. The big moral lie that we've dealt with for the last 50 years has been this, that an unborn child is not a human being, That's right. that it has no significance whatsoever and there is no moral implication to the destruction of that life. That's a big lie. It's a lie that the Supreme Court bought into in 1973 when they handed down Roe v. Wade. But I will tell you, this is part of the awakening, that God has moved in such a way that Roe v. Wade has now been overturned and there is no longer a constitutional right to destroy the life of an unborn baby. Psalm 139 says, you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. That's the 13th verse, the 16th verse says, your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed and in your book they were all written, the days fashioned for me when as yet there was none of them. That means that God had a plan for every day of that unborn child's life. And yet for the last 50 years, we have been destroying those lives on the basis of that lie. But my brothers and sisters, thank God Almighty that lies can never overpower truth. There were people who said, Roe v. Wade will never be overturned. And I would say, oh yes, it will. And they would say, how can you be so optimistic? I would say, because I read my Bible and the Bible says, ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened. And I've been praying for Roe v. Wade to be overturned. And millions of others have been praying for it to be overturned. And now we've seen the hand of God move in answer to our prayers. And I've got news for you. He's not done yet. The lie that homosexuality is good and right and normal. And now that there's no such thing as male and female, man and woman, that's just a social construct. Who would have ever thought that we'd be living in the times we're living in? Where as you've seen, I'm sure all of you have been exposed to it, where they're having drag queen story hour and they're taking children to bars where people, men dressed as women, parade themselves before young children and allow those children to place money into the, the, the scattily clad garments that, they, that they're wearing. This is an abomination. It's a lie. 
Leviticus 18, 22 says, you shall not lie with male as with a woman, it is an abomination. Leviticus 20, 13 says, if a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. Deuteronomy 22, 5 says, a woman shall not wear anything that pertains to a man, nor shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all who do so are an abomination to the Lord. That's what the Word of God says. All this transgenderism is an abomination to God. All of this homosexuality is an abomination to God. It is a lie. Now, we don't hate them. We love them. We pray for them. We want God to deliver them. But what we're not going to do is allow them to change our culture so that a lie becomes the truth. First Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 to 11 tell us, the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God, and it names homosexuals and sodomites among the unrighteous. And you all know Romans chapter one, it says that God gave them up to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, to, uh, to, to give them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts, who exchange the truth of God for a lie. It says, God gave them up to vile passions, men leaving the natural use of the woman, burn in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. In other words, they're bringing judgment upon themselves. God doesn't have to judge them. They're, they're, they're reaping what they have sown, and yet they want to tell us that there's something wrong with us. Oh, you believe that a man is a man and a woman is a woman? You believe that men were made for women and women for men? Oh, you believe that homosexuality is sin? Why, you're a right-wing extremist. There's something wrong with you. You're a bigot. You're a hater. You're a homophobe. They want to call us all kinds of names, but I've got news for you. It's not Bishop Jackson that's of that opinion. Jesus himself uttered the truth. He said, do you not know that from the beginning God made them male and female. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and cling to his wife and they too shall become one flesh. I've got news for you. The Supreme Court can issue a thousand decisions. The, the Congress can pass a thousand pieces of legislation. They can utter whatever decisions they want, but a man is a man and a woman is a woman because God said so. Homosexuality is sin because God said so. And marriage is a union between between one man and one woman because God said so. That's it and that's all. My brothers and sisters, you are looking at a man who was born into a broken home, raised in foster care, I was in foster care for the first 10 years of my life. It took a daddy to get me out of trouble. I was in gangs. I was committing petty crimes. Uh, I, was, I was not going to school. I was doing everything I was big enough to do. See, the biggest social problem we have in our country right now is not racism and it's not poverty. It's the breakdown of the family. It's not having a man and a woman in the home raising children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Well, I didn't have that and I was a wild kid. I was on my way to prison, probably drug addiction or death. And my father drove up on a street corner while I was standing there with my fellow gang members and summoned me over to his car and told me, he said, son, every time I see you, you tell me you want to come live with me. Do you still feel that way? I said, I sure do, dad. Sure, I want to come live with you. He said, get in. Took me to my foster mother's house and told my foster mother, my, my foster father was working, told her, I'm taking my son to live with me. She'd had me since I was 14 months old. She became hysterical. She couldn't believe it. She wept. She, she screamed. She said, you can't do that. Social services won't let you. The courts won't let you. My father said, Miss Beck, he called her Miss Beck. Her name was Rebecca Molet. My middle daughter's named after my foster mother. He said, Miss Beck, he said, I never gave my son away. He said, I just felt like I couldn't take care of him. He said, but now I'm at a point where I realize if I don't take over, my son's going to be lost to the streets and no, no telling what's going to happen to him. She said, he said, so I'm taking him. And she said, well, give me some time to get him ready. He said, no, I'm taking him right now. 
And overnight, my life changed because now I had a daddy in my life who took me to live with him. Some of you forgive me if you've heard this story. My father sat me down the first day I went to live with him. He said, son, you've been wanting to live with me. He said, now you're with me. He said, and I want you to know every day with me can be like a day of heaven on earth or every day I will tear your behind all to pieces. <laughs> and I found out he meant it. And I went from an F student in fifth grade who almost got kept back to being a straight A student in sixth grade. You want to know how I ended up going to Harvard Law School? Because I had a daddy who didn't tell me, America's racist, you can't do anything in America. Who didn't tell me, you're poor, you can't make it in America. My daddy told me, son, you can do whatever you want to do. This is the greatest nation in the world. There is opportunity here. I expect you to get up and go out there and get it. And all this stuff that we're hearing about racism, you know what my daddy told me? He told me, if you ever get into trouble, if you get into trouble defending yourself, he said, I will be there for you. He said, but if you ever get into trouble because you went and you knocked somebody in the head, you tried to rob somebody, you tried to steal something that wasn't yours, you tried to do something that you knew, know is against the law, that you know I don't want you doing, don't call me because I'm not coming. Now, I don't know whether he would have come or not, but I tell you what, that put the fear of God in me. He told me, you take responsibility for yourself. See, we, we, we are deep, we are, we are emasculating men. My father taught me to be a man is to take responsibility for your own actions. And what we're doing is making excuses for men. We, we've got men dressing up like women. We've got men who need crying rooms, men who need puppy therapy, men who don't know how to stand up and take care of the babies that they're making by the women that they're impregnating. It's time for men to stand up and be men again. And my father was a man, and he raised a man. May I just say this? I got into trouble with some, some of these leftists like the Washington Compost and the New York Line Times. <laughs> because they were out, they, they were, there was a group of homosexuals out giving literature to elementary school children. And I assembled a group of people to go and do a counter protest and say, you shouldn't be doing this. Do the parents know you're doing this? Do the teachers know you're doing do, this? Do, do adults know you're doing this? And they basically were arrogant about it. They said, parents aren't gonna tell their children the truth. We are gonna do it for them. I told people, I said, well, you know what? I said, I was there in behalf of other people's, other people's children and there, none of my children were there. I said, and I'm so glad I didn't walk up and find somebody dealing with my child and then lecturing me about how it was none of my business because I would have had to call on the anointing hard. <laughs> that father in Loudoun County whose daughter was raped in a girl's restroom by a guy who went in there pretending to be a girl. And when he went to the school board meeting to complain, they call him and his daughter a liar and he got a little boisterous about it. Now look, I don't support violence, but I can understand how you got a little bit boisterous about that because a man ought to stand up and defend his family. His daughter had been raped and he needed to stand up for her. <laughs> Moral lies. And then intellectual lies. Yeah, it is true. I graduated from Harvard Law School, but I didn't drink the Kool-Aid. <laughs> By the way, one of my classmates was Chief Justice John Roberts. He drank the Kool-Aid. A lot of it. But do you all know that John Harvard, who founded Harvard University, founded it for the purpose of training ministers to preach the gospel across this continent? And, and it was Harvard, by the way, who came up with this idea that we should no longer refer to pregnant women as pregnant women. 
we should refer to them as birthing persons. Yeah, that was a Harvard idea because now we all know that men can have babies. You know, you gotta raise your IQ 200 points to get to dumb if you believe something like that. Look, Yale University was started by a group of congregational, congregational ministers for the same purpose, to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you will find that particularly here in the original 13 colonies, many of the schools that were founded were founded for the purpose of propagating the gospel. They have betrayed their original purpose and they are off doing something that completely violates what the founders had in mind when they started these universities. I mean, Yale University had a meeting recently in which uh, the Alliance Defending Freedom showed up, a young lady, f female attorney, representing them to have a debate about freedom of speech. And the Yale law students had a violent protest and one of the girls who was a Yale law student got up in her face and said, I will literally fight you, B. That's Yale today. And these intellectuals are poisoning our country. And what's happening is dangerous. Look, critical race theory comes out of the intellectual community. In fact, it was started by a guy who was teaching at Harvard Law School when I was there, Derek Bell. He came up with this idea of critical race theory. He's considered to be the godfather of critical race theory. By the way, a mentor of Barack Obama. He came up with this idea that America is inherently racist, irredeemably racist, everything about it is racist. And then Hannah Nicole uh, uh, Smith, who is a, a professor, she got hired by North Carolina University, University of North Carolina, I think she, that ultimately fell apart. But she's another one who then took that and, and did the 1619 Project, which says essentially that America's true founding and true purpose was slavery. Now, my brothers and sisters, these are intellectual lies that have poisoned the entire culture. It is why so many people, did you see what happened this July 4th? With all these people saying, I'm not celebrating July 4th. I don't have anything to be proud of. This country had slaves. You know, somebody ought to give these people a real history book. Because America didn't invent slavery. By the way, my, one of my senators from Virginia, Tim Kaine, actually said, America didn't inherit slavery, America invented slavery. And I said that Harvard ought to take his degree back. <laughs> because slavery has existed since the fall. Since people began to gather together, one group has subdued and subjugated and enslaved another. It's happened all over the world to all people throughout human history. I mean, I, the, the, the Irish are one of my favorite subjects of study because I find their experience so similar to the experience of black people during the African slave trade. The British tried to enslave the Irish. The plantation was invented in Great Britain as a place to work enslaved Irish people. And it was imported to America. It wasn't started here. And they had all kinds of myths that they spun about the Irish. You know, they're, they're, they're sexual animals, they're lazy, they're drunkards, they're, they're dishonest. All they want to do is drink and party. They're, they're worthless. That was the kind of stuff that they were saying. About, in fact, one British scholar called the Irish white monkeys. But that's here again. It has nothing to do with race. It's what people have done all over the world. Whenever they subjugate people, they come up with a justification for it. Hitler had a justification for wanting to murder the Jewish people. He came up with a caricature of what he thought they were to make everybody feel, oh, this is justified. But it's not about race. My brothers and sisters, it's not the skin, it's the sin. And sin has been the problem from time immemorial. But I'll tell you what, not in the Middle East, not in Asia, not in Africa, not in India, was there an anti-slavery movement. But in the United States of America, because of our Judeo-Christian history and culture and background, we are the nation who said we hold these truths to be self-evident. 
that all men are created equal and endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Our nation says slavery is inherently morally wrong, but the rest of the world still hasn't quite said that because they're still enslaving people all over the world. So while these idiots want to condemn the United States of America, I suggest they take a look around the world and see where everything uh, has been throughout human history and all over the world, and they'll realize that they've got this myth floating around in their heads that the world was just a wonderful place and along came America and messed it up. <laughs> it's quite the opposite. When America was established, when the country was gained our independence. It was a brutal world. It was a vicious world. It was a world of conquest. And the United States of America brought the notion that revolutionized the entire world that people all over the world still call upon, that we are inherently free because we were given freedom by Almighty God, that we have rights because we were given rights by Almighty God. The government doesn't give them and the government can't take them away. And that's the basis for human freedom. intellectual lies trying to destroy this country. We were talking about France a little earlier in the green room, and you all know that France fought in World War I valiantly and, of course, emerged victorious. But do you remember what happened in World War II? Hitler took over France in six weeks. And the historians tell us that France had as much armor and as much ammunition and weapons as they needed to defeat Germany. But over the 20 years leading up to World War II, they have been demoralized by people telling them they shouldn't be patriotic, they shouldn't think that much of France. In fact, one famous French scholar, Anatoly France, said, unless we see ourselves as citizens of the world, not citizens of France, we are all doomed. Sound familiar? Because the globalists are trying to tell us this very same thing today. That you know they're saying the flag is a symbol of racism and the flag is a symbol of xenophobia and the flag is a symbol of fascism and we should not make so much of patriotism because patriotism, in fact, one of the founders of our educational system, John Dewey, said that patriotism should be denounced as something that was pernicious and did nothing but sow hatred into the hearts of people. That's what academia is giving us. Well, I just want you to know that I stand here as a Marine Corps veteran who stood in an office in August of 1970 and raised my hand and took an oath to the Constitution of the United States of America that I would preserve, protect, and defend it against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and bear true faith and allegiance to the same. All you veterans know what I'm talking about. That oath never had an expiration date. And I don't care what they say about our country, what they say about our Constitution, what they say about our flag. I'm going to stand up for the flag. I'm going to stand up for the Constitution. I'm going to stand up for our way of life because the Lord Lord gave us this nation. And, and let me just say for the record, I am not an African American, I am an American. One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. That's our vision. That's our hope. That's our nation. Glory to God. Glory to God. And then I want to talk briefly about one other kind of lie, the totalitarian and the tyrannical lie. You know, the totalitarian lie is this. Just turn everything over to the government. Because after all, we really know what's best for you and we will take care of everything. You don't even need to think about it. Just let us do it. We saw that during COVID. We've seen it in so many ways here lately where you don't need freedom of speech because some of what you think of freedom of speech is hate speech. Do you know what I'm preaching right now? They would say that's hate speech. And you probably shouldn't be able to say it. 
They don't want you to have freedom of religion. They want you to have freedom to worship in your own church, in the, between the walls of that church, and then, and then only what they think you should be saying and thinking. You all know that the Houston Five down in Houston had a, a row with the mayor over uh, this issue of homosexuality. First Houston mayor, first mayor of Houston that was homosexual. They sued her and she countersued and wanted to see all of their sermons to see what they were saying about homosexuality and try to get an injunction to stop them from preaching from the Word of God. That's the totalitarian lie. You don't quite know what you should be saying. And you don't quite know how to worship. We had the governor of Virginia, the former governor, Ralph Northam. You know, remember him? By the way, just a little private story. I ran against him for lieutenant governor. At the end of a television debate, I reached out my hand to shake his and he ignored it. So I tapped him on the shoulder to see if maybe he didn't see me and then reached out my hand again. It's on YouTube, reached out my hand again. He completely ignored me. And then went around the, the, the Commonwealth telling everybody else about how racist the Republicans and the conservatives are. And I thought to myself, him? That's, he, he, he's got the nerve to be telling us no, the totalitarian lie is, oh, and so this governor said, now Northam told us, you don't need to go to church. You can pray anywhere. One of the most godless governors we've ever had is going to dictate to the church that we don't need to gather together in church. So see, don't think for yourself, just let us do the thinking for you. See, but they don't understand the nature of our constitution. They don't understand the nature of our constitutional republic. See, for one thing, we don't work for them. They work for us. They don't give us orders. We give them orders. And we've delegated authority for them to serve us, not rule over us. And when they get out of sorts, like we did in Virginia last year, we kick them out and get some people in there who honor God and honor the Constitution of the United States. Yes, surrender that. Surrender your Second Amendment rights. I tell people all the time, people say, wait, you're a minister of the gospel. You believe in the Second Amendment? I say, well, I believe in the right of every human being to defend themselves. And I believe, therefore, in what the founding fathers said, the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So what would you do if somebody broke into your house? I mean, are you saying you would shoot them? Yes, I am. <laughs> Now look, if they didn't die right away, I'd pray for them. I'd try to get them saved, but I'd definitely shoot them first. Because you're not gonna come in my house and try to hurt me and my wife, and then I'm gonna stand before God and say, well, Lord, I would've defended my wife, but I'm a Christian, I didn't think that was right. Are you kidding me? And they wanna tell us, the law-abiding citizens of the country, you, you, you don't, you know, because some nutcases go out and abuse arms, abuse firearms. Well, nutcases abuse cars. They abuse axes. They abuse hammers. They abuse knives. They will abuse anything. But if you disarm the law-abiding citizen, you take away a fundamental God-given right that the government has no business taking away. So don't worry about Jesus coming, worry about climate change. Because we're going to save you from climate change, right? And, and as I said before, we, we will educate your children. We will explain to them, they're actually telling kids this, that when the doctor assigned them their gender, it was a guess. I kid you not. That's what they're telling kindergartners. And we will help you figure out what your gender really is. And you parents, you know what they're saying to parents? As the former candidate for governor of Virginia said, I am not going to allow parents to come in here and dictate to teachers what they can and cannot say. I would say, you better read Deuteronomy chapter six. I don't see anything there about the government teaching my children. The Bible gives me the responsibility and my wife the responsibility of bringing our children up in the word of God and the school system and nobody else should be interfering with that. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. The totalitarian lie and, and, and finally the tyrannical lie. And that's this, 
One person has so much knowledge and understanding that you ought to just defer to their superior wisdom. Now we witnessed the, tyr the, the, the tyrannical lie in Anthony Fauci. Oh, excuse me, no, Mr. Science. Because to criticize him is to criticize science. Now see, I'm not, look, don't get me wrong, I'm not picking on Anthony Fauci and I don't hate him. He just represents a spirit of antichrist that is alive in the world. This man has been a bureaucrat for 50 years. He earns $470,000 a year, more than the President of the United States. He will retire on a, on, on a retirement income of $350,000 a year, and we just found out that he and his cohorts in his agency get $350 million, have gotten $350 million over the last 10 years from the pharmaceutical agencies, our companies, that have come into their hands as royalties. He's not working for us. He's working for them, which is why he didn't allow any therapeutics. Ivermectin, that's horse medicine. Hydroxychloroquine, that'll kill you. In fact, I'm proud to say I was kicked off of YouTube for medical misinformation. But, but think, think about this, because this is really serious. How many people died? that didn't need to because there was only one answer and that's the vaccine. You know, we're having a problem right now, don't you? That people who have gotten the vaccine are getting multiple cases of COVID in the aftermath. He's already had it twice. And yet we're told, no, 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 no. Just listen to me because I'm the authority here and you folks are not. Therefore, you don't know what you're talking about and I do. I'll tell you something. I have the utmost respect for Andrew and Jamie and the utmost respect for these great ministers who are ministering today, but there's only one person to whom I believe I owe absolute and total obeisance, agreement in everything, in every way, and his name is not Anthony Fauci, his name is the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he's never wrong. He's right about everything. And he said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. I don't care who it is. The Bible says, let every man be a liar, but God is true. And we will bow down to him. We will acknowledge him. And I'll tell you what he told me. He told me, don't get vaccinated. And I'm doing just fine. Thank you very much. Hallelujah. The, the truth of the matter is, I think if the, the right person gets elected president, and I don't know who that might be, because look, here again, with all due respect, they always accuse those who supported Donald Trump of somehow worshiping Donald Trump. I know better than that. I know Donald Trump is not my savior. Donald Trump is not the Messiah. He is a flawed man, just like all others. And he has done some wonderful things in this country and for this country. And I honor that. I respect that. I'm, I'm glad for that. But I'll tell you something. I don't put my hope in Donald Trump and I don't put my hope in Anthony Fauci and I don't certainly don't put my hope in Joe Biden. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name, on Christ the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand because he's the only one who can save from the guttermost to the uttermost. He's the only one with a name that is above every name. And I've got news for you. His name is bigger than the Democrat Party. His name is bigger than the Republican Party. His name is bigger than politics. His name is bigger than anything that comes against us. There is none other name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved but the name of Jesus. Do I have a witness here? Every eye will behold him. Every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah. 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 So look, 
The truth sets us free. The truth saves us. Because Jesus Christ said in John chapter 8 to those disciples, it says, who believed in him, if you abide in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. Charis, that's what you're doing here, abiding in the word. He said, then are you my disciples indeed. That's what you're doing here, becoming disciples indeed. Because we got a lot of people in the church today who aren't disciples. They may be saved, barely, but we, we need disciples. He said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And then he said, Whoever's, whoever commits sin, whoever practices sin is the slave of sin. He said, and the slave does not abide in the house forever. He said, but the son abides forever, forever and whom the son sets free is free indeed. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes unto the Father but by me. He is the answer to everything that ails this country. I know people are searching for social justice and they're searching for diversity and inclusion and, and, and equity and all of that. But I've got news for you, saints. There's only one true liberator. There's only one true person who has been sent to save us from everything that sin has done to try to hurt us and harm us. And that is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And therefore, no matter what they do, we must never, ever bow down, ever bow down, ever back up. I see so many Christians doing the moonwalk. I see so many Christians backing up and bowing down and, and not wanting to make trouble. And I see it happening in places where I thought it would never happen. It's so-called quote unquote conservative institutions. But let me tell you something. It's not enough to be conservative. Why are you conservative? Where do your values come from? And if those values do not come from the word of God, they're subject to change at any moment. We've got to make sure that we are rooted and grounded in God's word because that's the unchangeable foundation that Jesus said, if you build your house on that foundation, if you build your family on that foundation, if you build your nation on that foundation, when the storms come and the rain falls and the floods beat against that house. It will not fall because it's founded on a rock. And what we're trying to do is to make sure that the United States of America stays rooted and grounded and founded on the rock. Because if it is, no power in hell can bring our country down. We will be a shining city on a hill. We will be that nation that is the last best hope on earth. We will be the nation that everybody looks to because we're a bright shining light. But we got to stay rooted and grounded in the Word of God. Now Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego faced this very situation. I don't know who was talking to the king, who came up with all this music that he wanted everybody to bow at, but he built this statue and told Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that they better bow down to it. That's happening today. People are building statues, building idols, and telling us we better bow down to it. You remember this? Joe Biden to the Americans of African ancestry in this country, if you don't vote for me, you ain't black. Well, I didn't vote for you. I'm still black. They're building idols of race. That race is everything. That race is your identity. That race is who you are. Wait a minute, look, wait a minute. First of all, this is just the house I live in. Hallelujah. Glory to God. God made me and saw me before the foundation of the world. He made me to look like what he wants me to look like, but I owe my identity not to my race. I owe my identity to the Lord Jesus Christ. I better get ready to quit. But when Barack Obama was president, people said to me, no, wait, 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 wait aren't you going to stand with the brother? And I said, well, first of all, he's not my brother. 
What, 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 wait, 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 what do you mean? I said, you are not my brother based on your complexion. I said, if you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, if you believe that he rose the third day with all power in his hands to be your savior, to be your Lord, if you believe that he's sitting at the right hand of the majesty on high making intercession for you, then you are my brother. You are my sister in Christ. I don't care what you look like. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God who is in all and over all and through all. That's what makes us one family, not the color of our skin. Hallelujah. Anyway, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Precious is that flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I feel like preaching in here. Hallelujah. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, no, we're not bowing down. They said, King, we're not even careful about how we're going to answer you. In other words, they said, we're not afraid of you. You don't move us. Somebody needs to tell all these high-powered politicians who think they're so much, we're not afraid of you. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? I've seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a green bay tree and that I looked for him and he was not. I sought him and he could not be found. Don't you get on your high horse, but believe me, God is higher than you are. And he said, if you don't bow down, I'm going to throw you in the fiery furnace. And they said, our God not only is able to deliver us, our God will deliver us. And you know what? He threw them in there. Now, you know, I've often felt like this. And maybe you all are different. But I've often thought to myself that if I was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and I'm being led to the fiery furnace, I say, oh, about, about a block away, I'd be strutting. But about 10 feet away, I think, I, Lord, you know, now would really be good. <laughs> Do something miraculous. But he took them all the way in. See, you may feel like you're all the way in, but it's not over. God's not done. I know some of you, well, if God was going to do something, why hasn't he done it yet? God knows exactly what he's doing. And sometimes we think we're waiting on God and God is waiting on us. I really believe that God wants to see the body of Christ stand up for who we really are and refuse to bow down and to answer the question that I posed at the beginning of this message. Yes, we will endure because God is still on the throne. We will endure because we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. We will endure because greater is he that's in us than he that is in the world. We will endure because our God is able. We will endure because we know that all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are the called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? So I'm not about to quit. Are you? I'm not about to back down. I'm telling you, stand up, step up, speak up, and refuse to back up because we cannot be defeated if we will not quit because we are on God's side and because we're on his side, he's on our side. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So don't say my way is hidden from the Lord. 
and the judgment that is due me is passed over from my God. Have you not known, have you not heard that the Lord, the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth does not faint, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He gives power to the faint and to them that have no might. He increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary. You are, I told you, I'm 70, but I still got a dance in my step. Hallelujah. For they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Come on, can I get a witness here? Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Victory, 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 victory. Can I just say one more thing about him? Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. Do you love him? Come on, somebody. He speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet that the birds hush their singing and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me that I'm his own and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. Hallelujah. Come on, can you say yeah? Say yeah. Say yeah. Hey, Lamont's on the piano. He, <laughs> he'll get you going. Amen. Amen. Did y'all enjoy that? Thank you, Jesus. Man, I love different ways that Jesus expresses himself. Isn't that awesome? Man, I don't think I could yell as much as he yells if I tried. But I love it. I love it. Let's have our prayer ministers come down here. You know, if God stirred you up tonight, if you've been one of those that's passive, man, you're part of the problem. I say it in love, but we're the ones that have the authority. The devil doesn't have the authority. God has gifted us with the authority. We're the ones that have power. And you know, it was Finney that said, if this nation ever ceases to serve God and fall away, the blame lays at the feet of the clergy because we're the ones that have the power. We're the salt and the light. And boy, what EW is preaching tonight, every one of us need to be doing that in your job, in your families, in your neighborhood, in your school boards. And it's because the body of Christ has been silent that the ungodly have been able to do what they're doing. So. I'm saying it in love, but if, if you don't share this, if you wouldn't speak up the way EW is talking about, you've been a part of the problem and we need to repent. And it doesn't need to be something that you just do internally and say, well, I think I'm gonna be bolder. You know, the Bible says that the Lord will keep that which you commit unto him. If there's no committing on your part, there's no keeping. You need to make a decision. And so tonight, if you've been stirred up and say, man, I need to, I need to speak up, stand up, and not back up. I can't remember all the things he said. But if you aren't doing that, please come and let somebody just pray and say, you know what, from now on, I'm gonna be different. I'm gonna start speaking the truth. And don't worry about offending people, you will. <laughs> you know, I was ministering to the youth today and I had one of the youth ask me a question. How do I minister to people without offending them? And I said, that's the wrong question. If your primary goal is not to offend people, well then you aren't doing what God told you to do. He said people would be offended. He said, if you don't offend people, well then you aren't like him. He suffered uh, rejection and offense. And if you are like your master, you also will be rejected. You, it's a deception to think that if you just say everything properly, everybody's gonna love you and come around. Jesus said, all those who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. The only Christians that aren't persecuted are ungodly Christians. 
If you live a godly life, you are going to be persecuted. You know, I was going to minister to a man one time. He was asking me a question and he said, um, he was telling me his problem. And as he was telling me this problem, the Lord showed me some things about him that were the problem. And it wasn't all of these external things. It was his attitude that was the problem. The Lord spoke these things to me and I knew that it had a potential of really offending him. And so as he was talking, I was sitting here debating, God, should I say this? I know he's not going to like this. He could be offended. And the Lord just spoke to me and he said, you have no right to reject the truth for him. If he's going to reject the truth, you give him the honor of rejecting it on his own, but you don't reject it for him. And if you're sitting there thinking, but I've got, I, I can't say, I can't speak up, I might offend somebody, then you are rejecting the truth for them. You aren't even giving them the opportunity. If you're afraid to be canceled on YouTube and things like this, and so because of it, you back up, you have self-censored yourself. They don't have to do it. Their intimidation. I'm telling you, there is a spirit of fear. There's a spirit of intimidation in the body of Christ. It's a spirit of antichrist is what the Bible calls it. It's not political correctness. It's not all of this wokeness. It's a spirit of antichrist, just like E.W. said. It is a demonic spirit that's operating. And if you won't speak the truth, it's because you have been intimidated by the devil, because you are having the devil lie to you. Now you got to speak the truth in love. I'm not saying you use the word of God like a club, but you've got to stand up and speak the truth. And I tell you, we need some people. I pray that one of the things that comes out of this conference is that some people will go home and grow a backbone and begin to stand up and speak the truth and get involved in your school board and run for office and begin to make a difference and say things. Amen. We're standing up here and we got people in this town that hate me, but you know what? I met with some of the city leaders this last week and I said, look, I don't want to cause trouble. I don't want to do anything, but I've been patient. You've lied about me. You've said things and I've not defended myself. I haven't done anything, but I said, you know what? You pushed us as far as you're going to push us. And I said, if you sit here and try and take our tax exemption away, they're trying to make me pay taxes because they, they envy the prosperity that we have and they're wanting me to give up my constitutional right and pay taxes. And I told them I'm not doing it. And they said, but it's only like what? Three, $600,000 a year. That's nothing compared to what we're doing. And I said, I didn't care if it was $30. I'm not going to give up my rights. I'm going to stand for the truth. And um, I told them, I said, if you don't do what's right, we'll take you to court. We're ready to fight. And we've got to get this attitude. Amen. It's just like E.W. was saying, somebody breaks into his house, he's going to shoot you and then pray for you. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Praise God. I'm going to stand up and use the rights that God's given us and we'll pray that these people get saved along the way, but that's not going to keep me from standing up doing what's right. So I encourage all of us to make that decision tonight. If there's anybody here that doesn't know Jesus, we've been talking about our freedoms and liberties as, as Americans, but I tell you, if true freedom is only found in Jesus. And even if you had uh, the government change and start doing what's right, yet yeah, not gonna set you free until you really know Jesus. So if you don't know Jesus, if you don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues, if there's anything we can do to help you, if you need healing in your body, please come and let somebody agree with you. Amen. So let's stand up. I'm going to close in prayer. And as we close in prayer, if you need something, please come and let us help you. Remember, we start in the morning at 830. Praise and worship has been powerful. And in the mornings, it's just been great. If you get here late, you're going to miss an important part of the service. So please be here for that. Then we got Barry Bennett and we've got EW again and Jim Baker in the morning. It's going to be a powerful morning. So Father, we love you. Thank you, Father, for what you've done. Thank you for the freedoms that you've given us in Christ. And thank you for the freedoms you gave us as this nation through the Constitution. Thank you for the people that have fought and died and suffered because they stood 
and bought us these freedoms. And I pray that you stir people up, that we will continue the fight. Just like Lincoln said, that we are engaged in a great conflict to see if this nation or any nation so conceived can long endure. Father, I pray you raise up warriors right here and help us to represent you properly. And so we thank you for it. We receive the word tonight and believe it's changing people's lives. Thank you for it in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. You be blessed. Be back in the morning. It's going to be a great day. Come down here and let people pray with you. We'd love to do it.